Hello, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Book Passages Conversation with Authors. Um, I'm your host, Paula Farmer, and happy Lunar New Year. How yeah. lucky are we to be hosting uh, this event? We were already kind of feeling very special and lucky just with the book that is our featured book, our author, and her in conversation partner, but all the more because it landed on Lunar New Year, the launch. I guess it's, a, it's okay to say the launch of Lunar New Year. Um, so that's really special. Thank you for joining us and supporting your local independent bookstore. Please take just a few seconds to like and subscribe to the Book Passage YouTube channel. Only takes you a little bit of time, but it really helps us a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and also take a minute as the authors are talking to think of questions and put it in the chat because I promise you we will get to your questions before this is over. <laughs> um, I finished reading our featured book, Joan is Okay, if you couldn't tell, um, and I love it so much. I just finished it. I love it. What a wonderful combination of wit, nuance, and intensity while exploring an interesting, quirky character and cultural issues and differences. Joan is a 30-something ICU doctor in a busy New York City hospital. She's also the daughter of Chinese parents who came to the US in search of the American dream for their children. Um, once they feel like their children are pretty settled, they move back to China. Um, and Joan has a very thriving, successful career. She's devoted to her work. She's devoted to her kind of loneliness, solidarity. She, she really likes that on so many different levels. Um, but her world kind of gets shaken up when after her father passes away and her mother moves back to the U.S., and other things come into the picture. Um, author Waiki Wang's previous and equally delightful best-selling debut novel is Chemistry. She is the recipient of the 2018 Penn Hemingway um, Award and a National Book Foundation 5 Under 35. Her work has appeared in Glimmer Train and The New Yorker, 
among other publications. Also worth noting is uh, Joan is Okay is the first edition pick for February for Book Passage. So that means uh, not only what an honor for our author, but it also means we have signed first edition copies for you, the audience members, when you purchase from Book Passage. Mm -hmm. um, moderating the discussion is a writer I greatly admire and have had the honor to work with on other previous events, the very talented and inspiring Maylee Chai. Maylee is the author of 10 books and is a recipient of an NEA fellowship in prose. Her latest collection of short stories, useful phrases for immigrants, <laughs> uh, won the 2019 American Book Award. And she is currently also um, a professor at San Francisco State University. With that, I'm gonna pass the baton to Maylee Chai. Great. Thank you so much, Paula. This is truly an honor and just such a moment of celebration for the start of the Lunar New Year and the Year of the Tiger. Um, Waiki, I loved Joan is okay. I also loved chemistry. Um, and just so the audience out there gets a sense, could you would you mind reading a, um, a little bit just so they can hear um, a little bit about the protagonist and hear your voice? Yeah, of course. I would love to. Um, so I'm going to start reading from the beginning of the novel. Um, you know, um, there's no real context that you need to know here other than um, Joan is a physician. She's an ICU physician. Um, and so I'll just read for five, five minutes. Thank you, Maylin. A common confusion is between intensive and emergency care. The latter is chaotic, usually on the first floor near the ambulance drop-off. In a room without dividers or enough beds, someone might scream doctor, and because no one answers, that person screams on. Intensive care is just the opposite. It's the best care that a hospital can give. And the room is quiet except for machine sounds, alarms that go on and off. Just as radiologists know their imaging, ICU doctors know machines, ones that push oxygen into you, the almighty vent, Ones that clean your blood, dialysis, the pumps, aka drips, that deliver medication and sedation through a central line directly to the heart. With many machines come many tubes, the endotracheal tube down the throat and to the vent for air, the nasogastric tube to the stomach for food, recto tubes for stool, a Foley for the bladder, etc. Fluid control was imperative. Too much fluid in and the body would swell, too much fluid out and it would desiccate. At my interview three years ago, the doctor asked why I chose intensive care and I said I liked the purity of it, the total sense of control. Machines can tell you things that the people attached to them cannot. I said, I like that the sick didn't stay with us long and for the stent, but for the stent that they do, we give it our all. A sprinter, I described myself. The idea of longitudinal care wasn't for me. My director praised my honesty and offered me the attending position right then. More so than any authority figure I'd met before, he seemed to believe in me and agreed with my point about machines. From then on, I knew that we were a match. In any specialty, an attending is expected to lead and guide her interns and residents along in their careers. To become an attending, I had trained for 12 years. The job was to teach machine readings, and a question I like to ask was, how is this patient interacting with their machine? What's the dance there like? If a patient fought, machine and patient became desynchronous. If they danced, the two were synchronous. Usually the patient fought. Our innate drives to breathe and to dance alone are strong. I taught on average three to five hours a day. The other hours were spent supervising procedures that I did in half the time pre-attending, I watch someone else do in double. If learning required mistakes, then teaching required watching different people make the same mistakes. Teaching was relentless deja vu, but grounding. It cemented the idea that we are all the same, height and weight did not matter, and the possibility of failure or success for anyone was never too far off. To streamline the process, I had a habit of printing double-sided handouts. And during morning rounds, the sound that I waited for and enjoyed most was that of my eight-person team, the pharmacist included, 
turning their pages in unison and on cue. The sound reminded me of the wind, which reminded me of being outside, which I currently was not. At my first year review, the doctor asked if I liked my new role here. I said I did. Did I respect my team? I said I respected them on more days than not. He commended my honesty again. Anything else he could help me with? Anything at all? As part of my hiring package, I'd been given my own private office, but I didn't like how it echoed or how far I had to walk from unit to office, cafeteria to office, office to another office, wasting time. A smaller, more centrally located space comes with people, the director warned, as in you would have to share it with your colleagues. And is that what you want? I said I would like to try. Soon I was relocated to a shared office with other attendings. The hospital had hundreds of doctors, but only 10 or so for three ICUs. To my left and right sat Madeline and Reese. Before I moved in, I had heard they had heard things about me, all true. The private office went to an older cardiologist who also wrote philosophical books about death. I tried to read one, but put it down. The books were too thick, with indexes alone of 100 pages. Death was inevitable. I didn't know what else there was to say. Thanks. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Sure. I think it's a great introduction to the character. Mm -hmm. um, Joan is you know, when we first get to meet her, kind of a no nonsense person who right. really, she doesn't like to read. Um, <laughs> she loves her job. She's, mm -hmm. you know, everything is about her job. She lives in this yes. nearly empty apartment in Manhattan. She doesn't watch TV. Um, she doesn't take her vacation days. Yes. Um, can, can you tell us a little bit about how you created this character? Right. So <laughs> I am a bit of a workaholic. I just know that about myself. Right. Um, and I think what happened during the pandemic is it kind of accelerated that a little bit for me. Um, I had been writing, you know, after chemistry, I had written, or at least tried to write this book about two friends going through college. Um, one, you know, one became a physician and the other one was sort of doing other things that were in the humanities. Um, and eventually I just became a little bit more interested in the physician character. So that character became Joan. I just sort of liked her singular mind. I was able to kind of take certain idiosyncrasies of working a lot, but also things that I, I'd been pre-med in college and, you know, I sort of had a sense of that world. Um, so taking the singular mindset of that training, being very, very good at one thing, being un indisputably useful, I think is kind of a good feeling. Um, and I thought I was really fascinated by it. Um, so I decided to kind of follow that character. Um, and the failed novel had been written in third person. And I personally, I think after a while, I just, I know that's the God lens. And I know that's sort of like the, 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 the reason why people write because they can sort of be God on the page. And I, I personally love the first person a little bit more um, because I have a chance to kind of weave in voice, weave in certain styles. Um, it's hard to be witty in third person sometimes because you have to be a little bit more neutral with your characters. Um, so I kind of transitioned into the first person through Joan um, and eventually the other friends sort of morphed into Mark, this kind of nosy, intrusive, but sort of well-meaning neighbor who really, really wants to be a part of Joan's life. Um, and she, she sort of just lets him after a while, um, but kind of this like, this, this sort of influence that starts spilling into, literally spilling into her apartment um, and kind of crowding her. Um, so it sort of morphed in, in, in that direction. And um, because I was able to focus on Joan, I was kind of really able to kind of hone that voice in um, and find, you know, this voice and rhythm that I, I really like to write. Thank you. Um, one of the things I noticed, like in your opening, Joan, this is a very the introduction to the character, she's very straight and narrow, very yeah. work oriented, but actually she's really funny. <laughs> she's very, very funny throughout. And she's just like the, the world that goes on in her head is very different from kind of her cut and dried world of medicine. Mm -hmm. um, like the way she's aware of odd things that people say, um, the yeah. differences in Chinese sayings and American sayings. Right. Can you talk a little bit about how you, like, I don't know, maybe what inspired that or how you kind of thought about that kind of interior life for your character? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so in some ways, you know, she, I, I started with um, 
I knew I wanted to write a physician character because I'm interested in women who work. I'm interested in sort of women who work in science and STEM fields that, you know, is mostly male dominated. Um, but I'm also, it's, it, you know, it's interesting because the health services is, is, you know, Asians are not necessarily a huge minority group and actually that, that workforce. Um, so I was deciding what kind of role I wanted her to be in because, you know, I couldn't just make her a doctor. I had to give her a specialty, et cetera. Um, um, and so the reason I chose the ICU before we now know what happens in the ICU um, is the machine aspect. And that's what I was trying to read there, that um, in the ICUs, there's so much about machines. You know, when I was visiting there and rounding um, with some of these attendings, um, when they describe the patient, right, the patient is completely knocked out. They're, they're completely unconscious. So it's almost like talking about this inanimate object that's just kind of lying there. Um, and the, the, the attendings just kind of list through numbers and talk through numbers and, 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 and make sure that, you know, um, fluid control, right. Things like that. So I was fascinated by how so much of the life-saving is really just reading machines and figuring out how the machines are interacting with the person. Um, and the one machine that I really like learning about was ECMO, which is this kind of like, um, exterior machine that sort of takes your blood, cleans it and brings it back to you, oxygenates it. Um, and I was like, oh, well, that's got, that's gotta be Joan's friend. Joan's kind of love this, this, this robot, um, machine and her personality kind of developed through there that she sort of has this endearing quality of anthropomorphizing like machines and vacuums, but having sort of a stunted relationship socially with actual people because she's always in these high state situations reliant on other things to help her get through it. Um, and so that was sort of like this mindset that I had about her. And I thought, well, how can I make her a little bit uncomfortable, right? Well, so at the beginning of the novel, her father dies and she actually has to think about grief. She has to think about um, how to deal with grief. And in the hospital, she doesn't necessarily grieve because she's just able to kind of go through the algorithm of death, of like running a code, of doing like postmortem care. Um, but but with her father's death, there's like a lot of things that she has to actually emotionally process that she's never really needed to do at the hospital. Um, and so I think that kind of brought up the language aspect. You know, language is something I'm obviously fast as writers I think we're, we're all fascinated we're both fascinated by language and how it works and being bilingual is sort of a great way to explore language and explore overlaps there's just so many neural networks that kind of overlap when you learn things um and then sort of see how things are different um I actually think you know some a lot of the sayings are either kind of completely opposite in English versus Chinese or they're kind of very similar you know there's a similar sort of sense of um um, kind of convergent evolution versus like divergent evolution, right? Um, and that she starts to think about a little bit more as she's thinking about, well, I'm never going to talk to my father again, right? I'm never going to talk to him again in either language. And, you know, we mostly spoke in Chinese and, he, and he's, she's thinking about those phone calls and just meetings that they've had together and kind of advice that her father has told her through the years that she never really consolidated because I don't think she's ever felt like she really needed to. Um, until until now. One of the things you bring up really well with the father also is this kind of like truncated sense of the American dream, mm -hmm. right? He once upon a time had an American dream, didn't work out. He went back to China to yes. find his dream. The brothers, um, Joan's brother has a very different, perhaps a stereotypical idea of what the American dream is to be as mm -hmm. rich and as successful. Yes. Joan's <laughs> idea is much more idiosyncratic. Yeah. Um, yeah. Was this a deliberate theme or something that developed as you were writing, working on the characters? Totally. It was very deliberate. I mean, I think um, right when chemistry came out was also when, you know, the big sort of like crazy rich Asians kind of movement came out. Um, and while I really believe that representation is important and, you know, kind of like that sort of huge representation on screen is really important. I just sort of was a little stunned at that sort of sense of kind of opulence and consumerism in a way that, you know, you, you do start to see in Asia, right? Because they've they've kind of modernized so quickly, right? In, in many ways, especially China, right? The, the idea that, you know, suddenly there's so many people who are now in the middle class and with the middle class, they can travel, they can buy things. Um, and there's a sense of kind of being able to support, show that. Um, and so, you know, the way that I created the the family was that the parents Joan and Fong's parents are sort of the first wave right this first generation of kind of people who come they're able 
kind of just to suck it up for, you know, the 10, 18 years that they're here, they're never going to really amount to anything enormous, but they're probably definitely not going to starve. They're going to work and they're going to be able to provide for their kids. Um, and then they sort of realize that they're just never comfortable here. And then they kind of go back. Um, but they've already sort of let Joan and her brother develop here. And they're just hopeful that they then sort of grow the family tree um, and, and flourish. Um, I think Fung takes this idea of like growing the family tree very seriously, right? That's his job. You know, he's thinking, well, I'm the patriarch here now, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm the head of the household. Um, father's in, you know, back in China doing his own thing, doing, you know, being his own, li living his best life, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I need to kind of establish the family in America. Otherwise, what was the point of doing all this? So at one point, Fong has this like really sort of like, in the same way that Joan is regimented, this really regimented way of like progress, you know, we have our parents, they kind of pass the baton and now you're going to pass the baton and, and then we're going to pass the baton forward. And then five or six generations down the line, you can be weird. But but before <laughs> that, you got to pass the baton. So with the Olympics coming up, I'm like thinking about that. I'm thinking of like, it's like a relay, right? You want to finish the relay um, and then you can kind of relax a little bit. But the first few stages, um, you have to be stable and you have to sort of be willing to give certain things up to thrive and survive. Um, so I think that's how Fung is thinking. It is just like Mark is, you know, all the all the all the male characters in here in some ways are are trying to quote unquote help Joan, right? They have their own sort of mindset of progress and like what is progress and how do I help Joan? And Fung is also somewhat well-meaning in that, you know, I'm the only family you have in this country. So I want to have kids so that you will have nephews and mm -hmm. whatever, right? And you will have a sister-in-law and now you need to marry so that our kids have cousins because they're not going to be okay if they don't have cousins, right? Um, so he has this like very rigid mindset of building this like empire. All the men are trying to change Joan in some right. ways. And what's awesome is you how you have Joan kind of pushing back like and it's also the reversals of power like even yeah. though the father is supposed to be the patriarch he actually lets Joan be herself right. then the brother it's the next generation who feels like they kind of pick up what, what would be like a stereotype in another novel as being oh we must be the strivers and the succeeders and it becomes right. kind of right. oppressive and what's so right. awesome is that you show how he kind of like kind of oppresses the mother right when she comes to live with him yeah. And she yeah. and he's telling her how she's supposed to live her life and live right. in luxury. And she just wants to go back to China right. and have her normal life. Was that mm -hmm. also a conscious theme that you wanted to show that reversal or did that kind of develop from the from the draw, writing the characters? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I wanted to focus on the younger generation more. Because, well, first of all, there is a point as adults, we, we, we stop blaming our parents for like all the problems that have happened in our life. We really need to take control of some of our own choices. Um, and I think Fung... And Joan just have very different stories. Like Joan was born here. She's never lived anywhere else. She's like in, in that way, sort of this like American American, you know, she, she doesn't know anything else. Right. Um, and Fung comes over when he's like 12 because the parents left early. It's a, it's a, you know, a very common origin story of the family separates for success, right. Valuing success over the family staying together. So he sort of just feels like he got gypped, you know, he got gypped for 12 years of childhood. Um, and then he really needs to catch up. So he feels in some ways that he and Joan are on completely different levels. Um, and he needs to either make up for it and needs to take care of Joan, but he also needs to tell Joan exactly what to do to follow this path. Otherwise, he's afraid she's going to meander. And, you know, interestingly, I kind of brought in Tammy, who is Fong's wife, and she come much later. She comes sort of in her grad school years. And that's kind of a different generation, even though they're all very similar in age, of sort of Asians coming to America and experiencing the American dream, right? Um, for, for Joan, the American dream is just her life. Like that is her dream. I mean, she doesn't know anything else. She hasn't left the country ever. Um, and that's her home at the hospital, right? Um, but for Fung and Tammy, I think they're both trying to prove something in a way that Joan actually doesn't really need to prove anything. Um, and so I wanted to explore that sort of younger generation, which is, you know, my generation as we're kind of becoming professionals, as we're contributing to society or in the working society, we're making decisions, we're sort of thinking about culture, we're thinking about representation, we're thinking about how we can contribute. Joan just wants to work at the hospital, that's all she wants to do, right? 
And, and Fong is like, but don't, don't you want your kids to be like athletes? Don't you want them to, you know, do something like, you know, be a successful news anchor? Don't you want them to have creative dreams? And Joan, I think is just, I don't really know what you're talking about. Um, because she's not really thinking that far ahead, um, nor does she kind of care to. And that, I think, is almost the luxury of a second child, like the second born, right? Because the first born is kind of taxed with a lot of these things. Um, so I wanted to explore that, like kind of the the three of them, Tammy, Fong, and Joan, are trying to have this un- unified family story, but they have such different backgrounds. How could they even have any common ground in terms of what they think is important? what their values are, you know, what, what the future will look like, right? Um, and even though they're similar in age, they actually have very different ambitions. Um, Fung and Tammy are probably a little bit closer than, than, than Jones. What's awesome about Joan is that she's such an unusual, she's like really a unique character in literature, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so much of American literature is like the, it's kind of like she has, like a woman has to find herself and she has to get married, has to fall in love and start that family. And Joan doesn't, right? No, she's like true to herself. Was that something you set out to do? Or is it again, um, was it like oppositional to like traditional novels where, you know, you have a young female protagonist and it's always, (laughs) it always ends in love, which is so nauseating. it's, it's, I didn't notice it until we had early readers and they they, you know, started emailing me saying, oh, I'm so glad these two people didn't fall in love or Joan didn't fall in love with someone or like, you know, she had so many opportunities to kind of find someone. And uh, I think when I was writing Joan, it just, that just never occurred to me as something Joan would do, like, like falling in love with, you know, people around her. I think she's almost kind of like a little bit disturbed at how sort of this rom-com is playing out or potentially playing out. Um, and so, you know, uh, I didn't want to take quote unquote, this like easy way out mm-hmm. of sort of giving the woman this partner, having her kind of fall into this like um, instability. Um, and I, I kind of just wanted her to be really stable in a, in a way that if she just lived her own life, the plot wouldn't move forward, right? The book would not move forward. Mm-hmm. So I needed a lot of external factors to kind of push her out of her comfort zone. And even then, you know, when she's um, finally starting to kind of mull over the grief of her father, she's not doing it in this like monstrous sort of self-destructive way. She's doing it sort of in pieces, um, which is sort of part of how she thinks and the logic of how she thinks that she takes the problem and she tries to problem solve through it. Um, but, But you're right. I mean, I think I was very cognizant of not making this Um, of course she wants to get married and have a child. Of course she feels like she's lacking something in her life um, because she personally is kind of content. So I wanted to kind of keep her that way and just have her be a little confused as to why no one does, no one thinks that she is content, even though she never uses that lens on anyone else. I think she never, you know, tells Reese or Madeline or um, Mark how to live their lives, right? Um, She never wants to, push her perspective onto theirs. And I think as a result, she gets all of these perspectives from other people. One of the things also awesome that you do in this book, and it's very subtle, but you can weave in very much the experience of being a Chinese American woman in STEM fields, right? Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot of projection of other people onto her. And there's that really, I feel like piercing sub theme with Reese when he becomes very jealous of her. For right. getting a promotion. Right. And he's like, right. oh, well, you got this because and he doesn't quite go there, but he's yeah. thinking it, right? Yeah. Again, yeah. like how, th- I mean, I feel I felt very real. Um, yeah. Yeah. W- again, did you know that you wanted to put that in there before, as you started or did it kind of just develop through kind of this workplace um, situation? It was one of these things where um, I think being a minority woman or being a successful minority woman in a male dominated field is sort of a double edged sword, right? Like if you're very successful, people question your success. Like, is it really your own, you know, or how did you get up there? If you're not successful, then it's because you're a minority woman in like a male dominated field. So I think, you know, for much of the story, um, Joan has this like undercurrent of sort of anger about how it feels like she never gets the consideration. You know, it could never be that she actually worked this hard to get there. It can never be that she's smart. It has to be either she got there because of the color of her skin or despite the color of her skin, you know? And it's never just because, well, I, I kind of paid my dues. I did all the hoops that I was supposed to jump through. 
I did them well. I didn't prevent you from succeeding, Reese. Mm -hmm. My promotion has nothing to do with your promotion. You can still get promoted. But for some reason, someone like Reese gets very threatened when it feels Mm -hmm. like other people are succeeding and somehow their success hinders his success. Um, When really in a field like medicine, it's actually not like that, right? Um, That, you know. And what's so awesome about Reese is that you have, he's literally the poster boy for the hospital, right? right? Because he's like quintessential. He's got the blue eyes. He's got that certain look. They literally put him on the posters to advertise, you know, their, their services. And that's not enough for him. And it's yeah. so much so that at the beginning of the book, I really like how, you know, there's that patient who's like, you know, doesn't want Joan. He wants the real doctor, right? Mm-hmm. Meaning Reese, the guy on the poster. Yeah. Um, and I thought that was very well done and the very subtle theme that's that's threaded throughout. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it it's almost like that's expected because he would make the critical care unit look good, right? In terms of, oh, you know, this very stately figure. Um, and, and like you said, at the beginning, Reese is just dole, doling advice out, right? Because he dates casually and he, you know, probably has a lot of success in that department. He doesn't want to settle down, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it's almost one of these things where he wants it all, but once you take away a little bit, it feels like he's taken, a, you've taken so much away from, it's like dividing by zero kind of, right? Like the, it, this impossible, you know, challenge that Reese is up because someone took a little bit of the pie that he can't kind of confront it. Um, and so in some ways, I think he also doesn't recognize that, you know, he doesn't always see Joan as like a person, right? And that's something that I wanted to kind of, um, sort of explore sometimes minority, you know, women who work really hard in kind of, in fields like this, they're not even seen as like people with lives and personalities or or women. They're kind of just seen as quote unquote robots, right? Mm -hmm. Um, robots who like machines, but Reese is also an ICU doctor and he also knows about machines, but he's not layered with that sort of like stereotype or kind of, you know, cage, right? Um, but but like Joan is. Um, and so it it does feel like, you know, a lot of things are against her. And that's why I think when I wrote the director, I had so much fun writing the director. I just wanted him to be this like pretty much no nonsense, you know, you work hard, uh, I'll give you more money. You keep working hard, I'll give you more money. It's like very sort of transactional person who's almost like no BS with her um, and is not really, you know, um, is not that kind of stereotypical boss of like giving, giving someone like her a ceiling. What is also great is like everyone is trying to always fix Joan, yes. you know, as a theme. And um, it becomes almost like a, like there's references to um, Seinfeld. Like yeah. when Joan <laughs> finally starts watching television, she watches Seinfeld and she's yeah. watching this old sitcom and it's like, and she's trying to analyze it. And like the characters of her life, you could see them, you know, kind of like coming in with their problems and they're trying to fix Joan. And it becomes almost comic, even though there's this yeah. very serious undertone, but it, it's very funny that, you know, at a certain level, these interactions right. was Seinfeld. Um, I don't know, was it an inspiration or was, what were their inspirations for kind of this workplace dynamic? About Seinfeld. Um, well, I think it's, you know, one of the things is like with Seinfeld and Friends, right? I think Seinfeld is probably aged a little bit better than Friends in some ways, but the, the sense of the neighborly New York apartment feel. Um, and I don't know how many people um, I've met who, you know, are le- learn English as a second language or something or abroad tell me that, oh, they watch a lot of sitcoms or they watch a lot of reruns of things. And is this how it's really like in New York? Um, this like buddy, buddy, everyone's funny kind of relationship. Um, and I really wanted to play on that because it's also one of these things of like a cultural cornerstone, right? If you can reference certain shows, um, you, you sort of, you sort of gain a, a sense of like respect or sort of knowledge. Right. Um, and so that was something I wanted to kind of play with, um, in terms of just the absurdity of, how Mark is, right? Mark is meant to be a caricature. I had no intention of making him, you know, in in a nuanced character of kind of exploring his feelings because this is technically a book through Joan's eyes, but I wanted to have a little bit of fun with him. And he's he's sort of this character that spills over. He has a lot of ideas, a hoarder, sort of his his external life is a great example of his, you know, internal life. Um, 
And I thought, well, why not kind of mirror that craziness in Seinfeld or Friends where there's always this crazy neighbor, right? In New York, everyone has this crazy neighbor. Um, and why, why not kind of just like lean into that a little bit? Um, and so that, that was part of it. And also, I think when I moved to New York, I moved to New York like six years ago, um, I went through a phase where I started watching Seinfeld. I don't know why. I just felt like I, I needed to just watch a few episodes just to figure it out because I was walking, you know, I lived by Columbus. So I was walking by like Tom's diner and I, my husband was like, oh, that's Tom's diner from the show. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And so the sense of having to kind of understand certain references for things, um, I just felt this like compulsion to, to get it, to not be left out. <laughs> Now, Mark is a character. He's always trying to, like you say, he's a hoarder. So he's always trying to bring furniture and all these things over to Joan. But he also brings lots of books. Yeah. And, and Joan is not a reader. And I, I feel that you must be a reader. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm just like, was that, was it hard to write about a character who is not a reader? Not at all. Not at all. Mm -hmm. um, I think because... Um, and if any of my friends are watching this, I'm very sorry. I was modeling Joan after, you know, some of my doctor friends from my like pre-med community. Um, we had a lot of interviews and just, I know their lifestyle, right? And the, the thing is so many people who are in research and academia and medicine, other than their own papers and sort of science papers um, and kind of being up to date on the literature or sort of like any kind of studies, they're not really reading any books, right? Um, and in terms of medical training, you can go through all 12 years of training without picking up a single novel, because that's really not what's demanded of you. And if you don't go to liberal arts school where, you know, you have to take an English class, um, you can completely bypass that altogether. So I do know people who sort of don't read that much and don't really care to read that much because I don't know the sense that fiction is made up, right? Why read fiction when we can read something very dry in an abstract or something like that? something serious. Um, so I, I, that, that wasn't actually that hard for me to write or imagine that someone like Joan wouldn't necessarily read. Um, but what I was drawing on a lot was, you know, when I first started my MFA program, I did feel quite behind in terms of, um, you know, my professors would be talking about like the canon and I just didn't know the canon as well as I should have. Um, so I had to do a lot of reading during my MFA in terms of like, you know, a lot of Chekhov stories, Thomas Mann, right? Um, um, a lot of Joyce in terms of just figuring out sort of part being part of that conversation. Um, so in that way, I did have to read a lot very, very kind of early doing the MFA and creative writing, um, just to figure out what people were talking about, you know, when they were like, oh, this is just like this story, you know, you're doing this in this story or in this play or in, you know, um, The Dead or something like that. And I, I was just too embarrassed to admit that I hadn't read it. So, so a lot of that time, like, you know, 10 years ago, I was reading a bunch of that stuff really accelerated. Um, and I, I can see where someplace like Joan, if no one ever told her what to read or told her about these books, she would have never come across it, even though she grew up here, she was born here. It wasn't just, it just wasn't part of her kind of sphere. What I appreciate, and then I'm going to go to some of the questions that are in chat, okay, yeah. some really good questions. But what I appreciate is even though Joan doesn't like to read and it's not her field, there is a moment when Joan starts reading and then there's she yeah. underlines a sentence from the old man in the sea. And I thought, well, there is a writer. I felt like the writer was coming through because just the way you brought out that beautiful sentence and the sentiment and brought it to the reader's attention was really lovely. Yeah. Um, I read Old Man in the Sea and in some, it, it's such a short book. So I think I read it while I was like waiting or something and I guess I waited there for an hour since it, it's a very very short book it, it, and it's you know one of the, the super lean um super sort of Hemingway-esque right um and I thought wow there's got to be a way that if I ever think about this that I could kind of use it for for something um and so you know obviously when she's reading it she's thinking about at that time she's still thinking about her father she's still thinking about sort of this idea of like struggling through things and if anything, that book is an extended metaphor for like struggling yes. <laughs> through 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 the you know the sea. So um yeah, that, that was one of the things that you know um I had read like a few years before that, and I just thought there's gotta be a way that I have to incorporate something like that into into my stories. Um, and I'm sure you feel this too, when you see a detail that you're like, there's gotta be a way that I have to remember this somehow so I can use it later because it's so good. I just need to figure out the right place for it. 
Well, that was beautifully placed. And I just, I really, just as a reader, I love that. So thank you. Thank you for all these details and the cultural, you know, references and just the nuances. This is just a lovely book. Thank but now you. I'm going to um, bring in some of the questions from okay. chat. Okay. Um, okay. You've got some really great questions. Um, so one person wanted to ask you about the cover. She says yes. she loves it. Can, did you have any say in it? And then there's on the side, if you could show, I'm, mine was not going to show too well. It, the, um, it's cool. actually like cool. Madman. It's Joan upside down. Yes, yes. Falling. Awesome detail. So can you tell us about the cover? Like how, were you part of the process? Did you have a say in it? Yeah, I was part of the process. Um, I think what happened, you know, this cover, honestly was pretty much done by the first draft. The color was there, the idea was there, the upside down A was there. Um, and we were sort of deciding between whether to kind of keep the A as is or put the person in the front and in the spine and sort of around. And then I thought, well, why not kind of have sort of this like little Easter egg on the spine because you would shelve books by the spine anyway and it would stand out, right? But at the front, you sort of just have the lettering um, in a way that, um, yeah, it's a little bit cleaner in terms of of, of the of, of the font and the writing. Um, so it's, I didn't have anything really to do with the design at all. We were just like picking colors, and we really just kept with the color that we first got, which is the blue, the yellow, the red. Um, I think my only kind of hesitation was chemistry was also yellow. So now now I have like another book that's kind of like light yellow. It's a different type of yellow. I get it. And then I'm thinking maybe my third book should also be some shade of yellow. And then I could just have all the, all the shades. <laughs> you can go straight to gold. I'll go straight to a powerful career. And it's <laughs> kind of upside down for her. Anyway, yes, another yes. question, because since you mentioned chemistry, we have a question about chemistry. Someone wants to know, is chemistry your story or perhaps partially? Is it, did, was it, in, you know, what inspired the protagonist of chemistry? Right. So um, chemistry, you know, in terms of autobiography, I would say it's a lot of that came from true experiences of me having worked in this like, you know, intense chemistry, organic chemistry lab during my undergrad. Um, I wasn't a grad student, but I think I could place myself in their lives since I spent like 40 hours a week with them. Um, and, and, and that kind of manifested um, pretty straightforward in that way. The story of chemistry is not necessarily true, like the, the idea of the proposal and things like that, but some of the emotional core, you know, I wrote that in my 20s. So the sense of, you know, your early 20s when you're sort of wondering, oh, what, what am I going to do with my life, right? <laughs> do I need to get married now or do I need to, you know, do something else and like get a job? Like what, the, that kind of angst, internal angst I, I kind of had. And that was poured into that narrator internally. For Joan is okay. It, it was actually very freeing because a lot of this, you know, it's not my life, right? I don't, I don't have a brother. Um, I'm an only child. I'm not a doctor. I had to actually harass my friends to tell me what they do and like interview them for hours um, about this. And then I was on Google Maps, like going through Greenwich because I, you know, I couldn't get on the train was during COVID and then rewriting it to incorporate aspects of our circumstances in the book. So in some ways it was so freeing fiction wise because I had to just make up so much stuff and imagine and invent um, for, for Joan. So in that way, it was, it, it was a complete like sort of detachment from it. And um in terms of the two protagonists, I, I do think they're in conversation with each other, but Joan has much more of an external crisis than an internal crisis. So she's actually, as you said, just quite content with her life. I mean, I wasn't content with my life as I was writing her because she, you know, she just takes over your mind, right? Like a character <laughs> like that. Um, and she's very content just living in your head, but it sort of drives the writer insane. Um, so in that way, it was a blessing to have her um, cause it was just such a contrast to that first character where I was sort of living in this like emotional turmoil, um, with Joan, it was sort of the comedy of her external life was, was, was just so fun to kind of actually just fabricate, you know, fun to read about. Um, and since you mentioned, um, interviewing doctor friends about their work is another, here's a research question about, did you do, um, what kind of research did you do regarding the drama of the ICU during the pandemic? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I had turned this book in February, 2020 done. Ooh. And then, and then there's, there's no pandemic in it because we didn't, what did we know in February, 2020? Um, and then March, 2020, I remember me and my editor had to get on the phone to kind of talk about it because I think she was a little concerned that 
if this book came out like a year mm-hmm. later, right, that the pandemic would be fresh in our minds and we would be a little bit, you know, and I had no idea that this Joan would come out during the peak of Omicron, like who, who could have mm-hmm. predicted that, right? You know, we were worried, oh, what if people don't know about it? You know, what if, what if it's all forgotten? And then we just came to the decision that it would be unrealistic to have something of this scale not affect Joan and not be part of the plot. So the only way I decided that I could incorporate the pandemic was to have it be a more important part of the plot. Like the mother, you know, worrying mm-hmm. about it, you know, Joan worrying about it, but more, you know, personally related to how they're going to live their lives. Um, so incorporating that was a real pain. Um, and I had done all of the research pre that, right. Post, post the pandemic, I couldn't go into the hospital because Mm -hmm. they had no visitors, like family couldn't even go in. So what I was sort of left with is I have a very good friend who's, you know, luckily was not luckily, but she was an ICU attending at Columbia during the height of the pandemic. So I kind of just like badgered her anytime she got off work, which she probably did not appreciate, but you know, I do acknowledge her. I'm very thankful for her. Um, and she was able to send me pictures um, of sort of the wow. setup. So I kind of saw that. Um, and then I was honestly just reading a lot of sort of the op-eds and kind of like personal histories in the New Yorker about the, the written by doctors and ICUs and nurses, especially nurses during that time, because there's so much like personal information coming out in those essays. Um, and that was really helpful for me um, in doing the research and in pretty much rewriting the second half of the book. I have to say, I'm shocked that this all came, like that wasn't part of the plan because no, it fits so perfectly yeah. with all the themes of all the characters. Mm-hmm. And someday, not when you're launching it, but someday you'll have to tell us like what was your original plan for the ending if it wasn't the pandemic? Because right. it just it really ties up the characters. It really, it it yeah. feels so organic. You, brava, you did a great job. Yeah, thank I mean, you. <laughs> and also I have to say, it was this is perhaps the most moving of all the pandemic fiction that I've read thus far um, um, in that there was that moment, it fits Joan's personality so perfectly when she's, you know, she's, everyone's exhausted, but this is what she's good at. This is what she's good at, but still she's so exhausted. And there's that moment when she's watching on television and seeing it through her eyes was very healing perhaps for me when she's watching the Surgeon General tell everybody not to wear masks. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and you repeat that line that actually was said at the start of the pandemic, don't wear masks, you don't need to wear masks. And she's sitting (laughs) in just shock, right? Yeah. And I felt like you captured the absurdity of that moment. Right, right. So well, and with this character. So thank you. I mean, awesome. (laughs) Okay, another question. I'm going to get to these questions. Um, someone says, why did you choose not to give names to a lot of your characters, such as the doorman, the hospital director, the three mm-hmm. nephews, the yellow cushion, the chair, which is called yeah. yellow cushion, um, the Korean yeah. exchange student? Mm-hmm. Well, I thought, you know, I, I think about kind of like characters in terms of primary and secondary characters. Um, and the primary character I do give names for, right? Mm-hmm. Joe and the co-workers, Mark, Fong, and Tammy. Um, the other characters I felt were more of like the secondary characters in terms of, oh, this is this is my doorman. This is, this is my relationship with this person. This is my director. This is my relationship. Anytime I, I find that, you know, Joan has sort of like the sense of authority or not authority with someone, right? She kind of sees the relationship in that way. Um, so, so that was a little bit more straightforward that the bureaucracy of a New York apartment building is you have the super and you have the doorman or the doorwoman, right? That's the bureaucracy of a, of a New York building. At the hospital, you have a director, many directors, you have the HR, you have IRB, you have et cetera, et cetera. That's just the bureaucracy of the hospital. And then I think I didn't name the nephews because I was wondering how, you know, in some ways I was like, I don't know if Joan could actually tell them apart at some points. Like she's thinking they're just, they're her nephews, right? They're always together um, and they're two years apart and they're boys and that's like their unit. And she's going to get to know them when they're adults (laughs) in a certain capacity, right? Um, So, so in some ways they're just not differentiated enough for her to kind of like put in, put a, put a name to that. Um, and so, you know, that, that, that's also kind of part of her, like, sort of singular personality, um, and, you know, flaws and all, um, I sometimes think naming is hard. Na- I find naming actually incredibly hard. Um, and that's why, you know, the first book, I didn't name anyone because I, I, I found that if I got into names other than 
like the boyfriend, Eric, I would have to, you know, explain some things. And I, I didn't know if I wanted to like do that for that first book. Well, what's awesome about the naming of like, this shows also Joan's kind of quirkiness because she does name yeah. things, right? Like there's the, there's yellow cushion, right? It's a name because like endearing name she's given for the chair. Um, and then also we get a lot about Joan's name, which makes it stand out. The fact that we get this whole history and the fact that like, you know, her mother pronounces it very differently. And then it comes from her Chinese name, which is Joe An, and then, you know, yeah. and then it's, but in English, it's not pronounced like that, even though mm -hmm. it's spelled mm -hmm. similarly. So I felt like that, like the, the kind of not specific names of these other characters really throws an emphasis on Joan's own kind of naming process and kind of the, right. the whole process of assimilation, integration, that whole idea that she comes from Chinese immigrants, right? Right. It's part right. of it. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't want to name someone unless I could kind of fully explain that, that what her parents wanted for her was this simple, easy to pronounce name mm -hmm. that had some meaning, but not necessarily, you know, as complicated as some, some other potentially, if she were in China, you know, named Fong has the Chinese name and that's what he's kept. Um, you know, Tammy picked her name like from a from a naming book. Um, and so like Joan has this interesting meld of it's like it could be in both, right? And it's sort of this Asian American, Chinese American kind of hybrid name. Mm -hmm. Um that, you know, I just I knew that I, I had to do that for this book. And I went through a lot of names, like figuring out how I could split up the characters, figuring out what would be like a simple name that I could sort of use. That. And it took it took a long time. I went through a lot of it, bad iterations of, of names. Well, it all, and it's a, it's a beautiful theme, thinking about yeah. the name as this kind of a symbol of the hopes, the dreams of the parents, but also kind of that divide. The fact that the mother can't really pronounce the name that she chose or right. pronounces it differently from everyone else. Right. Right. Now we have a doctor question. Oh, okay. um, this, I feel like this person seems like they know healthcare very well. And oh, it's actually, God. it's a theme you address. So okay. it, says, it says, I feel healthcare has become a business in the sense that output and paperwork seem to matter more than the patients. Mm -hmm. Does your book address these concerns at all? What are your thoughts on this? This is something that Joan is thinking about. It, and people, there's actually a theme about how people complain about their health, the healthcare and their workplace. Right, right. I mean, I think the the whole you know, sort of joke about the hospital is it is a huge bureaucracy, right? There's HR, there's like um, IRB, there's like accounts payable, there's, you know, like uh, so many different bureaus that um, Joan has to respond to. Um, and there's a line, you know, in, in, in there about kind of, um, you don't necessarily need to care about people to be a doctor, but you do need to care about people to be a nurse. Um, nurses are there 24 seven in terms of helping these people with sort of the daily tasks. Whereas the the metaphor for a doctor is, is oftentimes the architect, right? They kind of lay the plan out and then they just leave. They don't necessarily need to be there to do sort of a lot of the work that goes into the care, the medical care and the health care. Um, and in some ways, there's a point where Joan does have this kind of like crisis mm -hmm. of wondering if the system has helped her or not. Um, but she also is coming to this like, she also has this kind of strange relationship with the system because it's one of the only systems that sort of allowed her to thrive in the way that she wants to thrive in. Like, I don't think, you know, humanities or being a writer or being a movie star or being like an entrepreneur would have been as merit merit based in a way that the hospital work has been for her so she understands the system is totally broken and she understands that it is not you know people say it all the time it's broken it's sort of incentivized by certain you know business right mm -hmm. but she also recognizes that she's doing well and she was allowed to do well mm -hmm. and she wasn't held back by you know what wasn't held back by her like status by her parents' status mm -hmm. by things like that so she also has to reconcile with that in, in in some ways with her kind of like you know disillusionment with the system there's also some humor in the way i feel like hr is almost yeah. the villain <laughs> and they like their their kindness and they're trying to like need to help her almost becomes like the villain of one point of the plot Mm -hmm. um, because it's the opposite of what Joan's personality needs. Right, right. And it, 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 I won't say anything more because it, it leads to a, a great plot twist. But yeah. um, had you always thought, had you thought of that? Like, had you had that plotted out when you first started writing? No, I didn't. It was one of these, you know, with editors, I think one of these things is like, you try 
multiple avenues and they don't tell you what to do. They just tell you it doesn't work. So I think I tried multiple iterations of figuring out how she was going to deal with HR. And every time, you know, matter is like, I don't think this is working. Can you just think about it some more? And so I just think I thought about it. I thought about it. And the solution was actually very simple. I was like, why didn't I think about this before? You know, I, it kind of ties at the beginning. It makes the most sense. I just think you have to try a lot of bad avenues to figure that one out. Um, and that was actually just very, once I realized that that was the plot twist and I, I think this book taught me so much about writing plot because usually in literary fiction, oftentimes the plot is not something you really think about. This book taught me so much about plotting and sort of like event and pacing um, that that scene with HR in, in, in the middle of the book is, is really important and sort of kind of brings the story to the second half. Um, but, but I, you know, I was a clinical researcher for like a year and a half. Uh, would not recommend that job, clinical research assistant. So it was a lot of paperwork, a lot of going to waiting in lines, a lot of kind of like, you know, getting ethical approval to do like studies on humans um, and going to like five different departments in the hospital and then realizing, you know, you, you like did the paperwork wrong, so you had to do, do it again. So there's like kind of crazy Kafka-esque experience of like working in the hospital. In one way, the hospital is very, very efficient, right? If you're dying, they'll try to save you. But on another completely different side, there are certain questions of like in, in, like unequal access to care, right? Um, insurance, you know, big pharma, right? Um, like unfair compensation across different spe specialties. Um, and in some ways, Joan almost doesn't get into it because she's like, well, I make what I make, whatever, you know, I'm just fine. But her brother is like, but you could make more. You could make so much more doing other stuff. And she just is thinking, I'm fine where I am. I don't need to be the cardiologist that writes these books and gets the private office. I don't need to sit in first class. I just want to do my work. And, you know, she says to the to her director at one point, she's like, you could just pay me a dollar and I would I would be okay. And he almost thinks that that's a joke. Like she's trying to make fun of him, but she's, she's actually really not. I just, I mean, again, I, as I said, I feel like this is the best of the pandemic fiction so far. I feel like oh, you really captured you. it because it's driven, it's character driven and it shows why someone who's really good at being a doctor is a doctor and right. how they can handle a crisis. And it shows, it shows all the, that's bad, but also all that's good, yeah. um, which is, the complexity is what makes it interesting, but I want to, but I'm not a doctor. So have you oh. heard from doctors who have read this, including like maybe friends you've interviewed, oh, if right. they read, man, they're probably right now, no doctor in America has any time to read a book. It's probably no, no book, to read a maybe book. like five years hoping if the pandemic ends, yeah. they'll maybe read it. But have you heard, I don't know, from any doctors who've read it? Um, I think, okay. The friends that probably have read it are sort of mum about certain things to me. I think because in many ways, they know, you know, if you're actually friends with like a writer, you know, whatever you say, I'm probably going to use later on in some capacity. Um, so I think they're they're sort of waiting for us to kind of all get together and sort of talk about it. But I don't think they were surprised about the book. I mean, in some ways, I wasn't I wasn't going to write House of God. I think they knew that I wasn't going to kind of glorify medicine, but I also wasn't going to like say that it's terrible, you know? I, I, I think a, a balance of both is really essential. And what I respect about certain doctors and certain nurses and health professionals is that a lot of them, you know, realize at the end of the day, it's it's like not necessarily this kind of like calling that they have, it's, it's just this job that they have to do. Um, and they're very good at it and they're trained to do it. And then they go and do this job. Um, so that was kind of the avenue that I approached it. Um, and I hope my friends like it. I think it, it, if I could think about what they would say, they would be, they would probably ask, is this me? Cause that's what they ask about all of my books. Is this me? Is this, this person? Um, but a lot of it is, you know, when you write fiction, you make up like, I don't know, like 50%, 50%, if not more about these characters, then you kind of blend them all together. I feel like with like there's there's some moments that are just really I mean we've talked about how funny these parts are. Mm. There's also moments that are really poignant, and right. I just think there's a scene like despite like all the conflicts with Reese and Joan and even um, is it Madeline who's the the yeah. one that, that that Reese is pursuing at one point, yeah. and there's a moment when they're just exhausted and they're just sitting there and they're just so exhausted, and I thought that was handled so well um, to have that moment. Right. It's like, you know, um, to have that moment of peace 
And then I want to just read what um, Paula has put in to chat. It says, I love the passage where Joan is looking out of the hospital window while clinging to the medical machinery. <laughs> It was both kind of poignant and funny, but very indicative you mean, of you mean, you mean this, this medical machine? I don't know if you can see it. No, unfortunately, it's showing oh, the no. backdrop. Oh, no. Ew. If you put it, like, maybe Wait, close to your... Oh, uh, why is this background doing this? Let me see if I is can... Is it green? It, yeah, it's a little bit green. If it's green, then that's why. It's oh, a green screen. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, yeah, so it's that scene where... Um, it's a very poignant scene because she has to kind of um, say goodbye to ECMO, which is like her favorite. It's like her favorite machine. Um, and she has to kind of like, you know, like she wants to say goodbye in a certain way. So she takes the machine and she goes to the window and she like looks out at the park. And that's kind of this like it's kind of like her gaining some sort of closure <laughs> with the machine. Um, so, so I just knew that had to have, be there because um, I just really love writing about ECMO. So let me see if I can do it now. Can you see it now? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, awesome. So this was like, um, this was the, um, the image on the New York times book review. Um, and I like tracked down the illustrator on Instagram because I loved it so much. Um, and I thought, can you just send me this copy? So it's Joan hugging the ECMO machine. Oh, awesome. Yeah. That's a fantastic, that's a fantastic illustration. Yeah. Um, so I, we're almost at the end of time, but I just want to, I don't know if this is appropriate, but I'll ask. Sure. So are you working on a third book now? No, I, I think this book caused me so much PTSD in terms of having to rewrite half of it. Yeah during this like developing kind of like mass panic that we were in um, that I'm not necessarily thinking of a third book. Um, but I, I will, I, I think um, after my first book, I was really nervous. I would never write again, or, you know, you, you sort of get these ideas of, Oh, I'm out of ideas and blah, 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 blah. But after this book, I, I'm sure I'll write another book. I think I just need a little bit of time to kind of recharge, fill the tank, um, maybe write some stories. Uh, I've been writing shorter fiction, which has been really fun, um, and sort of humor pieces and just like essays and exploring other genres. Um, I would be interested in writing like a horror, you know, like a horror story or something that's like completely out of or, you know, a genre story. I just want kind of like to flex my, my muscles a little bit in something else. Oh, that'd be awesome. I would love to read that. And Paula is back, so I will. <laughs> oh, hi, Paula. <laughs> Hello. Um, I, you know, I rem remember reading on the back of the ARC and maybe on the hard copy as well, where someone said that they would read uh, the back of a cereal box <laughs> yeah. if Weeki, uh, Weeki uh, wrote it. And I'm like totally there. So whatever you've got in store for the next book, I yeah. think you have a built-in audience. Um, I could do the cereal box. I mean, I I, I did <laughs> do a lot of cereal boxes when I was. That where you're you're probably at about that point. Like yeah, yes, I'll do a cereal box, not a whole book. <laughs> well, thank you both so much. This thank was such um, a fun and inspiring conversation um, about what I'm sure is going to be one of my favorite books of the year, um, making my top 10. Um, and maybe as always, you just uh, bring such poise and elegance to every conversation. Um, thank you so much for stepping up and doing this. Thank you. Oh, this was that an was honor. Really thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And I just want to remind those in the audience live and later in tape, we have plenty, plenty of copies of Joan is Okay at Book Passage. Uh, feel free to get it online. Give us a call. A bookstore is <laughs> happy to fulfill your orders or safely go into one of our stores in San Francisco or mm -hmm. Corte Madera. We'd be happy to help out. And because it's a first edition pick, we have a lot of first edition copies that are signed yeah. on Likey. Uh, thank you for doing that too. We love that. I like bike down because Random House was closed, right? So I biked down on the coldest day in New York <laughs> and then got a visitor's pass to try to get in to sign all the books. Um, so I really enjoyed doing that. I'm so glad you have them. <laughs> Oh, and see, and I'm picturing you being in your apartment or the fireplace. No, I like, I was, I'm on the time. 
and I biked down 60 blocks because I didn't want to get on the subway. I was a little bit, you know, I'm a little bit nervous of subway sometimes. So I biked down 60 blocks in the cold with like a plastic bag over my hand because it's so cold and then signed all the books. <laughs> wow. Uh, we really need you to buy her book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you went to great lengths to get assigned copies, people. But you'll enjoy it. It's fabulous. You'll want to share it and gift it. Um, once again, thanks to both Thank our authors you. and to the audience for your support. Thank Until you. the next time, be safe. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Paula. Thank you.